Harless Wilson sat with his elbows resting on the table. He was reading the early morning newspaper as the purple hues of the approaching dawn were peering over the horizon and through his kitchen window. A steaming cup of strong black coffee sat in front of him, and he had the paper folded to the local section. Correctional facilities escapee still on the run. He skimmed the article through his weathered and decidedly scratched reading glasses. Reading about how a week had passed since the escape and how the authorities speculated that the escapee was still in hiding in Pasco County. Pasco County, Harless thought. Puts him right in my backyard. They were confident that he would have been apprehended very soon, as an intense network of investigative teams had put a dragnet in place and were zeroing in on the fugitive, the article read. Bluish smoke lazily wafted upward as he slowly brought the cigarette to his elderly lips. He sat the paper down and grabbed his coffee, and after a careful sip, placed the cup back on the table. He finished the final drag from his cigarette and crushed the butt into the ashtray that was close by. Today was a special day for him, somber but special. It was his final day of running one of the Titan engines at K&M Railroad. He's worked for this company for the better part of 45 years. He started working for the company as a coal shoveler when he dropped out of high school in 1966. The way that he got the job was a matter of luck. It was a literal coin toss that would determine whether he or another young fellow applying for the job would have gotten it. They only needed one more set of hands. The hiring supervisor flipped a coin, and Harless came up on the winning end. From that point forward, he worked diligently and faithfully over time to finally secure a position as an engineer. But it was no easy feat, especially for a young African-American man in those times. Nonetheless, he'd achieved what he wanted and had operated the massive machines successfully all this time. Today, he would say goodbye to it for good. He, of course, pondered how he would spend the rest of his future. Operating the trains was really all he invested his time and energy into doing, so he really didn't know how he was going to sprawl out the rest of his living years. He speculated that he would cross that bridge when he got to it. Right now, it was time to get to work and see what was on the books. When Harless Wilson arrived at the station, the air was already muggy and stiflingly humid from the steam coming from an already idling train engine. The day keep, Carl, handed him a clipboard and tipped his hat as he walked away. Harless glanced at the document on the clipboard. He was delighted to see that he was going to be running what was referred to as a dead snake. This was a pretty sizable load of empty train cars with no cargo. A pretty simple run, as there was no urgency to push to get these cars to a certain location because there was no cargo to deliver. Harless pleasingly looked at the colossal engine and then surveyed the cars that were attached behind it. There weren't too many, maybe about 25. With a faint nod, he placed the clipboard under his arm and turned to head toward the break room to get a little more coffee for the morning. As he was opening the door to the break room, he bumped into Carl, causing him to nearly spill his own coffee. Oh, excuse me, said Harless. Just heading in that way before I roll out. Carl responded in a thick southern Dixie drawl. Got you a snake gonna ride the rails today, eh, Harl? Yep, hell of a way to bring in my last day. After years of hauling this, that, and God only knows what else, last day hauling nothing at all. Guess it's easy enough. Well... Headed to Tennessee, you should be back tomorrow early. We'll have a cold one or two to send you off. How about that? Harless walked toward the coffee maker with a slight smile on his face. He nodded, not looking back at Carl. The door closed, and Carl was off to his other tasks. Carl walked along the side of the collection of train cars to inspect the snake, to make sure that the hooks and pulls were in place and that all the proper cables and hydraulic hoses were secure. As he was looking at one set of hoses, he was determining whether or not that old toss pot Ralph Wendell had rightly connected the quick release chucks, or if he'd gone further into his cups and said to hell with it and just threw them together. As he surveyed the situation, he could have sworn that through his periphery, he saw a dark leg with a boot raise up and into the doorway of the engine's driver's compartment. He paused, and looking in that direction, 
His eyebrows furled as he started to slowly stroll toward that location. He walked through billowing mists of steam that were emitting from the undercarriage of the engine as he continued toward where he was sure he saw a leg disappear into the doorway of the compartment. Harl? He'd never noticed Harless come out of the break room, and anyway, he would have walked right by him to get to the engine. Approached the engine and jogged up the stairs to the driver's compartment. He stuck his head inside the door and looked around the interior. He didn't see anything. Maybe he hadn't seen anything at all. Could that have been? Just imagined it, he thought. Stepping inside the engine, he waited a few seconds longer and decided he hadn't seen what he thought he might have. He then turned to leave the engine's cabin and to make his way back toward the previous car that he was inspecting. But just as he did, a swift-moving, shadowy arm grabbed him by the back of his shirt collar. It happened so fast that he had no time to scream, but there was time enough for his eyes to go wide in their sockets as another arm swung around and with a calloused and filthy hand grabbed Carl's chin and wrenched his head violently backwards. Carl's neck was broken and he fell heavily like a sack of meal. The two dark and mysterious arms of an assailant then jerked Carl swiftly up and dragged his limp frame back to one of the cubby holes. He had been hiding in one as he waited. And now the assailant, who was indeed inside the engine, sat slouched in the darkness of the void cubby hole as Carl's twitching body lay next to him on the floor of the engine. Having had enough coffee for the rest of the morning, Harless walked toward the idling engine. He looked around for Carl but didn't see him. He thought nothing of it and climbed the steps toward the driver's compartment. After a few regulatory tasks that were common before starting the train into motion, he sequentially maneuvered the slow progression of the engine and it began its acceleration. A few minutes later, Harless Wilson was gaining a gradual speed on the rails, forward and en route to Tennessee. The billowing steam vapors spewed from the pulsing, thundering engine, and the tracks began the familiar shrieks, squeals, and scrapes that were obligatory. The chaotic noises soon faded into the steady clanging and hissing of the speeding wheels' revolutions. Harless reached for the communications radio and held it to his mouth to speak. I'm going to take you up on those beers when I get back tomorrow, okay, bub? No answer. Harless figured he must be out behind the facility doing inventory on the oil barrels. Later on, the train was rushing forward at a fast pace, and it happened pretty fast since this dead snake had nothing but empty cars attached. He looked onward through the window, and he watched the landscape elapse into his past, and thought more about the impending retirement that was approaching. Retirement that was reaching for him every bit as fast as this train was now traveling. The assailant, who was still crouched and hiding in a void with the corpse of Carl next to him, waited as Harless, who was standing at the control board, was jotting down his log notes on the clipboard. It was 10.05 a.m. The train was now traveling at an upwards of 80 miles per hour through the green, cow country terrain. In minutes of staying and hiding in the cubby hole, the assailant quietly stepped over the corpse of Carl and carefully and slowly peeked around the divider wall to see Harless preoccupied with looking forward and out the train's windshield. After about 20 minutes of staying and hiding in the cubby hole, the assailant quietly stepped over the corpse of Carl and carefully and slowly peeked around the divider wall to see Harless preoccupied, looking forward out of the train's windshield. It was at this point that the assailant pulled a rusty paring knife from inside his left sock. The knife was one that he lifted from the kitchen from the correctional facility that he'd escaped from last week. This knife wasn't going to do much damage, but just enough if push came to shove. Still looking forward, watching the scenery pass by as the train rifled forward, Harless was completely unaware of the quiet steps behind him. The escapee was silently moving closer toward Harless's back, and he was moving very stealthily as he approached him. As would happen, the stealth was broken when Harless suddenly turned to face him. Shocked by this unfamiliar, unkempt, and wild-looking individual, Harless's eyes went wide, and he attempted to make a move toward the assailant, 
The man raised the hand, holding the knife, causing Harless to freeze instantly in a slight running pose, looking frozen like a statue in a kid's game. Uh-uh, Pops, the assailant said as he waved the filthy blade of the knife in Harless's face. What the hell is this, and who are you? Harless asked with a hectic and shaken tone. You don't need to worry about who I am. All you need to worry about is keeping your mouth shut and keeping this train of rolling forward. No slowing down. Y yeah, but what's going on? What you doing? Asked Harless. What's going on is I'm getting the fuck out of here, and you finna help me do it. I left that Hilton I was staying at last week, crawling through mud and eating worms and staying low. Now I'm finna get out of this shithouse town. Where this train going? He demanded. Harless slowly sat down in the seat next to the control board. He just looked at the man and said nothing. The man, impatiently, asked, Where this train going, old school, or you gonna have your guts in your lap? Tennessee, Harless Wilson replied with a hoarse mutter. Okay, that's good. Now things gonna be real cool, long as you stay cool. Don't let your old ass get you into anything you gonna regret. We get to Tennessee and I'm a hop. You don't say nothing and we're cool. You good? He was wiping off the blade of the knife and testing its sharpness with his fingers. He was making it a point of letting Harless see him do it. I ain't gonna do nothing that's gonna put my ass out in the wind, Harless said. What you mean, old man? The assailant replied. I guess you ain't never heard of harboring a fugitive. Okay, I tell you what, I go ahead and cut your throat right now, and you ain't got to worry about it. How'd that be? said the assailant. Probably be better. I'm pretty sure you ain't know how to run this train anyway. Probably just end up crashing and burning. Only ain't no telling how many people you take out. Just take it easy, old man. Everything's gonna be okay. Long as you stay straight and don't cause no ruckus. The man's eyes rolled wildly in their sockets as he panned his head back and forth as if looking for someone else in the driver's compartment. Harless slowly turned his head forward to look out of the windshield of the engine again. Great way to go out on my last day, he thought. A tense and stressful two hours drew out as the train hastily dashed through the landscape, passing through three industrial areas, rolling thunderously near some residential districts, and then back into a green setting where tree lines on either side fluttered past, creating blurry walls. The two hardly spoke to each other in that time, save for pointless small talk that Harless was growing very tired of. He had a growing rage building up within him, and every time he looked at the assailant's wide-eyed glance, it grew even more. You know, it's really hard for me to believe that I've traveled the countless miles that I have to what seems like thousands of locations for the past four to five years, only to end up here with a useless dog fart like you, Harless said with a slight smirk. Yeah, bitch, ain't it? The man replied. Yeah, it is. But maybe that's been the sole purpose all this time. I've been traveling all that way. All these years just a waiting for you to get here so that I can put a stop to your ass. What the hell you talk? The man croaked out as he watched Harless stand up and slowly advance on him. Come on. Come on, you oily piss ant. Harless said. Man, sit your old ass down before you hurt yourself, the man said and he was beginning to laugh as he watched Harless go into a ridiculous boxing stance that looked like it could have been on a promo photo from the 1920s. He might have expected him to say something like, Put up your dukes! Next. But Harless didn't say that. Instead, he said, You ain't going to Tennessee. In fact, you ain't even staying on my train. Man, you getting yourself into something you ain't going to like. You, was all he was able to get out. And then he saw a white hot flash as Harless connected with a right haymaker. It hurt surprisingly, and he sprawled backwards from where he'd been sitting. Harless stood swaying back and forth with his fists up, ready to attack again. 
The assailant held his jaw in his palm as he shot his glance with teary, bloodshot eyes wide back at Harless. He stood up slowly and threw the paring knife on the engine's floor. With his considerable size difference and advantage of youth over Harless, the brutality that commenced then was unspeakable. Several hours passed, and the train was now moving at 110 miles per hour, still barreling mercilessly up the rails. It was now five o'clock in the early evening. Harless sat muttering on the seat at the control board. He bled profusely and was broken and bruised from the brutality he had endured at the hands of the maddened assailant. I told you. Didn't I tell you? Now look at you. All busted up. Should have never... He looked alarmed now as he watched Harless suddenly begin taking fiercely labored breaths. He looked like he was suffocating. He grabbed feverishly at his chest, and the grimace on his face was followed by a silent, breathy scream as his mouth opened widely. He was shaking uncontrollably, and his feet were battering a heavy tattoo upon the floor. The man watched in horror as Harless's eyes flew upward in their sockets, throwing his head backwards to face the ceiling. His gyrations seemed to move in harmony with the rumbling of the speeding train, and panic started to grip the assailant. He could see that Harless was dying, and there was nothing he could do. Running to Harless, he lifted his head in a desperate attempt to do... something. He saw that his jaws were clenched shut now, and his teeth had clamped down, biting halfway through his tongue. The blood that flowed was immeasurable. After a few more minutes of watching the seizures... He then stood with a horrified gaze as he saw Harless's body go limp and sat slumped in the seat. Harless rocked in syncopation with the rhythm of the rumbling train. Now, with Harless sitting lifeless, bloody, and slumped at the control board, the train was barreling up the rails at well over 120 miles an hour. It was now, indeed, a runaway train. Over 67 tons of serpentine mass rocketing through a landscape with blurring trees at either side. The assailant stood dismayed at the realization of having lost absolute and complete control. Now what the fuck am I going to do? He croaked. Frantically looking around, jerking his head from left to right, he then fixed his gaze upon the control board. It might as well have been an open book of Greek lettering or Egyptian hieroglyphics. There was no way in hell that he was going to be able to stop this train once it got to where it was going. The only option was to jump. Now, it had been several hours since they had left Pasco County, so by now he was sure that he was far enough away that he could make a clean getaway. Might as well jump now. Headed to the door of the driver's compartment, he lifted the heavy steel lever that engaged the lock, and with a hefty pull, opened the door with a quick slide. The speed that the train was rolling was earth-shattering, and the noise of the wind in the tracks was deafening. He braced against the blast of the wind and committed himself mentally to making the jump. After a minute of perspired hesitation, he glanced back at Harless, who was still trembling from the vibration of the train. He looked ahead into the distance through the windshield, and then looked back outside the opened doorway. Just as he was going to make the jump over the stair railing, he lost his footing on the wet, slick deck surface and started a clumsy plummet toward the granite rock bed of the tracks. Volumes of pain shot through his body as both of his legs shattered along with his pelvis. His torso was nearly twisted backwards as he rolled horridly end over end across the rocks. The train continued its ear-splitting roll forward as the man's fractured and fissured body was tossed pell-mell along the granite bed. He came to rest in a topsy-turvy position, writhing in complete agony as he watched the train quickly reduce in size. It gained distance, and the light mounted on the back of the rear car dimmed in its intensity as it rolled out of sight. The pain that racked the man's body was indescribable, and before another 60 seconds could pass, he blacked out. Later, after what seemed to him like several hours as it was dusk, the man was jarred back to the waking world by the intense torture gripping his body. His breaths were heaving gasps. He looked across the tracks and noticed that not too far away there was an abandoned service station along what looked like a dirt road. He would need to get off the rocks and away from the tracks to try to find something similar to safety. But he would definitely need to find some shelter to get away from the elements, whatever wild animals would want to make chow out of him, and even another passing train. He mustered all the strength that he could to try to cross the tracks, but his movements were next to impossible. 
With every breath he took, the pain seemed to grow more and more. His body was bloody, beaten, and shattered. His legs were useless, so there was no way for him to use them for any momentum at all. It was all upper body. That was what he was going to have to use to get over and across the tracks and toward the abandoned service station. After about 20 minutes of his complete and seemingly futile efforts to make any progress away from the tracks, all he could do was rest his head on one of the rails. But then suddenly, he was startled. He could feel the rails vibrating. At first, he wasn't sure if he was feeling anything at all and maybe it was just the trembling of his body in response to the pain. But after a minute, he was certain that not only could he feel a vibration in the rail, but he could hear it. A train was coming. This is exactly what he wanted to avoid. He jerked his head in the direction of the south, but he saw nothing. He still felt the vibrations, and they seemed to slowly and gradually become more intense. He then jerked his head into the position of the north and saw what looked to be a very dim light. He watched it as it started to grow in its intensity. It was definitely a light. It was a train. He desperately and frantically tried to move his body off the tracks, but he couldn't move at all now. Maybe because he had been laying for too long that his muscles just gave up the ghost. The pain was too intense for him to move. He could barely scream, but was managing to do so as the light's brightness grew more and more piercing. The train was rapidly approaching, and he couldn't move. As he watched the hulking mass get closer, he saw familiarity. It was the rear car of the train that he had jumped out of. It was Harless's train. He was wondering how in the hell this was possible. Maybe it was a hallucination. At any rate, it didn't make a difference. It was headed right for him. He moved jerkily and desperately, but to no avail. He couldn't get up and over the tracks, and this train was barreling toward him like a predator toward prey. Inevitably, the train rushed over him, and his already ruptured body was reduced to a disgusting mass of gelatinous gore. His quivering remains then lay underneath the tumultuous chaos of the dashing train. About an hour later, and past sundown, the train slowly and finally came to rest on the tracks in a rural area somewhere in Citrus County. It had exhausted its fuel. It was eventually discovered by railroad officials after reports from the depot in Tennessee stating its failure to arrive, and then after an investigation, it was released back into the possession of K&M Railroad. Both Harless and Carl's bodies were sent back to Pasco County and examined by the ME's office. Their deaths were ruled as homicides. It was surmised that they were murdered by an assailant that boarded the train unseen and acted as a stowaway and after murdering the two, made an escape somewhere during the travel. What they don't know is that Harless was vindicated posthumously, and he did it himself. The way that it happened was through some bizarre kismet. As the runaway train barreled forward on the tracks, the vibrations were so acute and fierce that they caused his limp body to fall forward. He fell against the controls of the board and seemingly preternaturally caused the train to go into an instant and aggressive loco reversal. No one had seen that when the wheels spontaneously went into reverse, they had emitted a screaming and fiery volley of sparks as the rails shrieked with all the hellish sounds of fire, flood, and the end of existence. They hadn't seen how. It had rolled forward with the glowing hot wheels moving in reverse for nearly three minutes before it started its gradual advance backward. They hadn't seen how the train made a long descent in reverse to imminently avenge the wrongful death of its 45-year veteran engineer. They also hadn't seen how there may or may not have been a slight grin on Harless Wilson's face as he lay on the floor of the engine facing the ceiling. The assailant was never found and as with many other unfortunate cases, went cold over time. The K&M Railroad Company erected a memorial at the station in honor of Harless and Carl, with a special notation plaque commemorating Harless's unflinching 45-year term of service to the company. The engine was also retired. It was moved to the rear yard of the station where it sits today. 
inhabited only by the growing weeds that have weaved their way up through the windows, openings, and crevices. And the sounds of its once mighty motor are now replaced with the buzzing sounds of the katydids and peepers that have now made it their home.